Welcome everybody. Uh, let's just get started with it straight away and I'll do some introduction in just a few moments. This is the question I gave you to begin. Um, how would you solve this? And so, much like Blue Peter, I really should have been a children's TV presenter. Here's one I prepared earlier on. Uh, so there's the question we produced for you. And the methods, uh, interestingly, when this was sent out on a WhatsApp group that I'm a member of, 200 odd people um, of mass leaders across the country. And because it was sent to secondary teachers, the immediate thought was to go to algebra 1.4x and things like this. Um, another reminder, by the way, please, if you could turn off your mics, um, that would be useful so I can hear some feedback coming from someone. Um, yeah, so for those of you in the primary sector, you're more likely to have used this method, but this is the first thing I did. If we know that the, uh, the amount paid for the kettle is two fifths of the toaster, then for every five parts of the toaster, two of them are the kettle. And we know the whole thing is 105. So what we've got there is 105 divided into seven equal parts, which I make to be 15 of each of them. So we know the toaster costs five lots of 15, uh, which equals 75. We're also told, looking at the question, the total price before the discount should have been 113. The toaster was reduced by 20%. This is an interesting line to me. So the toaster was reduced by 80%, 20%. Now, if that means this cost here, the 75, is the equivalent of the 80%. Now, I want to know how much, therefore, maybe 10% is, which is, what, £7.50? I could divide that Unknown quite quickly. participant is now joining. Another participant is now joining. By the way, £7.50 is completely wrong, I've just realised, because I prepared that earlier as well. Um, I divide it into 20%. And so uh, four blocks here to divide into £75. This is not a bus stop. This is short division, which I'm going to have a moment about later on. Uh, but I've worked out that each of these four blocks is worth £18.75, which means, of course, this blocks the whole 100%. Each one is £18.75. With that, though, in mind, if we know that the reduction should have been 133 and it went up uh, to 105, £28. Take away the 1875 is how much the toaster went down. The answer was £9.25. Now, of the a range of people listening today, we've got maths teachers from secondary, we've got primary teachers who want to learn about and teaching about maths, we've got people considering being trainees, so um, a really wide range. It, this wasn't expected of anybody, but the method I've used is one that I've learned because of this teaching from mastery program that I've been on for the last two or three years. I can't tell you I knew anything about this bar model three years ago, um, but I'm learning from some really good people because I'm involved with the NCTM. A reminder on this screen, and I can still hear someone's mic is still on. Please, can you turn off your mics? Um, if it's yours, Paul, if you could turn yours off and just put it on when you're um, reading some of the chat questions for me. Uh, but I'm certainly hearing somebody's mic at the moment, so please turn off the microphones um, because I can keep hearing people back and I'm sure that's editing other people's hearing as well. <laughs> Would you please turn off your mics because we can hear your children. My child, child is hidden the other side of the house. Um, why should bar modelling be used? Well, I didn't know this. This is a paper written in 2004. And with the aid of these strip diagrams, the bar models, children can use straightforward reasoning to solve many challenging story problems conceptually. Now, this is where I tell you that that starter question is for 10 to 11 year olds. And the reason I, I make that clear is because I know it was part of an 11 plus test and I find that really, really interesting. The maths involved, the fractions and the reduction and the, the short division is all key stage two. Annette um, McNally so, is now joining. Somebody's now joining, apparently. I'm sure you just heard that. Um, an example of why it should be used by everybody. Now I'm hoping I can start doing it like this so you'll be able to see. Uh, from that paper from Beckman, they did this question. Laura had $240, she spent five-eighths of it. How much money did she have left? The overall percentage, Singapore children, 78% of them got this right, and the United States, uh, only 25% of them. Now, why was Singapore so successful? They've learned how to use this representation. They've learned how to, pupils access the structure of the maths, which gave them this tool. And again, I didn't know anything about uh, the bar modelling really about two or three, uh, three, four years ago, maybe. I think it's one or two topics I've used it for. Um, but it's a fabulous tool. And if we can teach pupils the bar modelling, able to represent it themselves, um, it'll make life 
a lot easier for them to interpret the question. Just to show you an example of that, the whole thing is £240, so I changed it to pounds. She spent five-eighths of it, so I've broken that 240 into eight equal parts. And do you notice I put the question mark next to the three that I actually am asking for? When I'm teaching my pupils, I ask them to state everything they know, but also to write the one bit they're trying to find out. And they're trying to find out the three-eighths here. The maths or the abstract maths involves, there are eight boxes, a total of 40 pounds. We want the value of three boxes, so we find one. Uh, and then we find out which one of them is. And yes, I was just checking my WhatsApp to see about the um, uh, all and the rest of the group if they're telling me they can see everything. So now I'll go to one side. Awesome. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, again, please turn off your microphones. I can hear microphones coming back, which will uh, make it uh, a worse sound for other people. And I think we've got about, yeah, I can hear a child talking. So please turn off your microphones if you can. Um, but thank you for tuning in. Should explain who I am. My name is Tom Manners. There's my Twitter handle because. In edgy Twitter at the moment, there is so much being shared, and it's such a good place to be. That's what I look like a couple of years ago when I had less grey hair than I do now, but it's a nice photo. Um, but that is kind of what I look like anyway. I'm the subject pedagogy lead for maths at Arthur Terry Teaching School. I work the, with the PGC associate teachers on maths um, for general pedagogy, a little bit across the whole board as well. But my specialism and my passion is absolutely maths pedagogy. It is completely accelerated since I started working for the NCTM as well. So I work for Arthur Terry three days a week, and two days a week I do my own thing. Uh, some of that is taken up by NCTM uh, because they used me as a teaching mastery specialist uh, whew, a couple of years ago now. Um, but as I really point out, my, my knowledge of maths teaching has absolutely accelerated because of my involvement with the NCTM. Uh, and as such, I've gone on to an accreditation as a professional development lead. Um, when we do these professional development courses, we don't always, well, we don't very often mention how to do it online as a webinar. This is a little bit unique to me, so please be patient with everybody. Uh, with me, everybody. Um, Paul, I can see your face. Uh, any questions at this stage or anything, or shall I carry on? And this is relying on Paul to stay there, by the way. Um, and I'm guessing not, so I'm going to carry on. And I'm assuming people can hear me at this stage. I could be talking to myself. Who knows? Some information requests. Uh, the session was initially designed as a teaching for mastery session for Key Stage 3 using the NCTM's five videos, which I intend to try and cover today. Um, today's attendees are actually now mixed with primary. In fact, a lot of primary um, people involved from the ATLP and associated schools. So thank you all for being interested. I've got trainees considering maths as a second subject as well for Martha Terry. Uh, I've also got plenty of secondary teachers um, and some people who are going to be training with me as well next year. Given the nature of the session, we'll op operate a hands up only policy, which will require producer Paul to be listening. Well, I hope he is. There's your cue to say hello, producer Paul. I'm listening. Yeah. Good, good, good. So let me know if anything comes up on the chat area, if you could do OK, Paul. Will do. Thank you, producer Paul. <laughs> Uh, and there it is. Producer Paul will direct me towards the questions when they pop up. So I will just continue assuming everyone's listening and assuming everything's going OK. Now, I've mentioned the NCTM. They created 37 maths clubs across the country. It's going to be 40 as of um, September. And there's the link there. And the, my suggestion is to go and to find out what your local hub is. There is so many different events going on um, all year round. And I'll go through how you can be involved towards the end of the session. In fact, at the very end. Um, but it's absolutely changed my practice. I, I know so much more now. I, I cannot tell you how different I am um, as a practitioner for the last two years and how much better unquestionably I am. I enjoy the conversation of maths with people more than I ever have because you come together with the maths hubs and share ideas and share conversations. So therefore, tip one, and I think I've done five tips today, join the mailing list for your local hub. Um, just you'll get the local, you'll get the events that are coming up for primary, secondary, early years. They do cover the whole range through to post 16 as well. Um, I, I strongly suggest you sign up for the mailing list for your local hub. Uh, this is just a slide I found about secondary math that was um, being advertised. Some of the events going on, such as teaching for mastery work groups. I run one of those. I also run an embedding mastery work group um, for GCSE. Here, you've got challenging topics, mathematical thinking at GCSE. One that maybe primary and secondary colleagues would be very interested in, an area I'm incre incredibly passionate about, is year five to year eight continuity. I find it incredible, incredible how little secondary schools engage with what the primaries have done. 
Um, and the way we approach maths, the reason I think I can do today's session is the way we approach maths is no different in key stage three, four, two and one. There should be no difference. Certainly the teaching for mastery ideas from the NCTM cover all the key stages as far as I'm concerned. Um, want a department wide improvement in maths teaching, embedding technology mentioning there, a project supporting core maths. Um, is something that maths hubs are very good at. In fact, one of the leaders across the country is in the central maths hub, Tom Carpenter. And I can tell you after Terry, we've got Claire Wilson there, who's very good at that. If you want to know more about the uh, the core maths. So which is your local maths hub? If you are in Staffordshire, Stoke-on-Trent, Warsaw area, the North Mids maths hub is the one for you. If you're in Birmingham, Dudley and so, uh, Samwell, um, you want to go to the central maths hub. There is a new hub being launched for Solihull. I don't know if you can see that on screen, so I move him. Yeah, um, a new hub has been created to serve Solihull, Hall, Coventry and Warwickshire. It's going to be opening at Tudor Bay and Solihull Hall from September. Uh, and so that's worth knowing as well. But please do sign up for your local hub. OK, let's, let's talk some maths. Um, well, we teach pupils, all of us, I assume, and pupils and in fact, adults often have very, very contrasting views of people, uh, pupils, uh, views of maths. Um, this people here doesn't look like they enjoy the maths. I hate maths. It's all rules, rules, rules to remember. Is it? This pupil says something different. This pupil says, I love maths. There are no rules to learn. Now, interestingly, if we teach maths, well, I'm not going to say the right way. Uh, let's just say maybe the more effective and maybe the better way. Let's, let's just try and use that terminology. It's hard to say right and wrong. Um, but there aren't any rules. Maths is, is an interconnected subject. This is one of the first lines on the national curriculum, and it's very correct. It's very true. Maths is an interconnected subject. And if we can make people see the connections between all the, the, the different topics we teach, then it comes together as one language. If we teach, let's say, short division in a different way to where uh, if we don't link it to area of a rectangle, if we don't link that to factors, if we don't link factorising to factors, we talk about um, highest common factor in key stage three. When we do factorizing a quadratic in key stage four, well, they're, this, they're using the same word, factor. And if we connect everything together, maths makes a lot more sense to our pupils. So today's session is called, what is teaching for mastery? And you'll have noticed I put the word mastery in inverted commas. That's because everyone disagrees with what mastery is. For me, it means that learning is sufficiently embedded. It's deep. It's connected, as I just mentioned, and we're fluent and we'll come to fluency as one of the five big ideas shortly. And if it is fluent and connected and we've gone deep with the learning by using greater depth questions, by reasoning and problem solving, then it's going to be sustained. We're going to be building upon it because we're making those connections because the subjects are related to each other. And as I say, they're connected to each other as well. And that's our job as teachers to, to make the pupils realise that it is interconnected. All the subjects in maths do have a kind of related topic that we may otherwise teach at a different time in the year. So this word mastery is such a big thing at the moment. And I'm meeting schools who tell me that we do mastery and I do mastery in year seven and eight. Oh, but we don't do mastery lessons in year 10 and 11. And I don't know what they're talking about. Now, I'm not going to say I'm going to exactly explain what mastery is. What I'm going to do is in the next five minutes or so go through few different organizations what they say mastery is and the problem is no one can really agree now if i just go back a slide if we can agree that mastery is for embedded learning uh, so it's sustained and can be built upon for me teaching for mastery is teaching for understanding and that is surely what we want i don't want to teach tricks no one wants to teach tricks because then you've got the rules let's go back to that little girl just here she doesn't like maths because she thinks it's just rules, rules, rules. And if we taught them the trick, let's say KFC, probably the one I dislike the most, dividing fractions, keep flip change. Well, that only applies to that subject. Foil for expanding double brackets. That only applies to expanding double brackets when you've got two terms in each. What about if we put three terms in? Suddenly it doesn't work. And that's why teaching of the mastery has to be deep, connected. So we make those connections that can be built upon. If we be, uh, put, uh, children are more likely to be fluent in their maths. So the national curriculum, what does it say about mastery? What does the NCTM say? Which is obviously what I'm going to talk about mostly today. And I'm not going to say I'm, you know, I am a teaching for mastery specialist. And I've just done my inverted commas with my fingers there as well. It doesn't mean I like the term. I do not like the term at all. Um, 
Now, there's a very good document, uh, the National Association of Maths Advisors, NAMA, have produced a really helpful document on this about the myths about mastery, worth looking through, because they'll say there is no mastery curriculum, there is no mastery lesson. No one can agree what mastery is. So I'm probably not going to use the word mastery going forward unless I'm describing a title or something, because it's teaching for understanding. That's what I'm looking for. That's what the NCTM, that's what we're all looking for, surely. We want our pupils to understand the maths we're teaching. EEF did their, the Education Endowment Foundation, did their research into mastery learning in 2018. And what they're saying is keeping the uh, outcomes constant, but varying the time needed for pupils. Some pupils need longer, but there's one set of mathematical ideas for all. The idea of the national curriculum states clearly that the majority of our pupils access the same curriculum. But some pupils might need more time. And I know that primary schools do a great job with further intervention on that. Now, this is interesting. Mastery learning breaks subject matter and learning content into units with clear objectives to pursue until they're achieved. Now, again, someone's got their microphone on. If you could please turn that off. If you have questions, please put them in the, in the chat box. Uh, but then everyone can hear you. So please, can you turn off your microphone? I'm listening to a TV at the moment, for example. Please turn off your mics. Learning for mastery. Now, a lot of people have considered this to be the, the start of the, the, mastery, um, the mastery journey, if you like. And this applies to many topics. Bloom believed there are five variables needed to create successful mastery learning. And there it is repeated that the EF said the time required by the learner, the approach taken to meet the individual learner's needs. Some people might need the drawings. Some people might not need the drawings. We talked about the bar model a little bit earlier on. The amount of time allowed by the provider for the pupils. Now, of course, secondary schools really struggle how to give extra time, but primary schools, they often in, um, will give extra time in the afternoon for maths and numeracy. I know that you do that. I know there's research going on about Emma Mac from Emma McRae at the moment, uh, looking into how secondary schools can give that more time for maths. But the problem is, of course, there is a whole curriculum of other subjects to learn as well. You'll be pleased to know there is some um, elements that we can expect the pupils to get involved with. It's not just all about what we provide as a school, the verbal ability of learners to enable them to solve problems and to reason. I hope I'm using the right word now, but if we use uh, pronouns like it, as opposed to uh, the length of a rectangle, makes a massive difference. If we can just use the proper language. So when I'm asking for the area of a rectangle, it's not seven times five because that's the one on the board. It's the length times the width because that's always true. And if we use the proper language, we're particular about that language in all classrooms, we can be making a real difference to the learning of our pupils. And you'll be also pleased to know, yes, for kids to learn for mastery, they've got to give time. So it's not all on us. One of the five variables, absolutely, the, 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 the learner, the pupil, has to be, be willing to give that amount of time as well. And for those of you who access things like Hegarty Maths or MathsWatch, when you can see how long the pupil has spent on the work, that's a great conversation with them. Have they properly watched the videos or not? Uh, a paper from 2010, Thomas Gusky, who's done a number of interesting um, papers on CPD as well and professional development. Um, a couple of things worth pointing out here. Now, what that he's talked about is the pre-assessment. So before you go into a block, let's say on adding fractions, there are prerequisites. You need to know what a fraction is. You need to know equivalent fractions. You can't do adding fractions unless you've learned about equivalent fractions. And I'm going to go to this next slide. Now, if I, I think you can see my mouse as I go along. The test prerequisites. Now, again, this is not what everybody believes. This is a, a diagram taken from a Mark McCourt book, Teaching for Mastery, which I'm probably put on screen a little bit later on for you because it's sat right next to me. Everyone has to be above 80% until you start the unit. It's like building a, a build, um, imagine you look a big pot, pot of land and you try to build a 10 story tower on it. If you're building it on dodgy foundations and the, and the mud is soggy, I'm gonna pretend I know some science here, um, and it, it, it's incapable to build on, well, you can start putting tier after tier up, but it's gonna fall down if the foundations aren't strong. So the idea here about these prerequisites, everyone above 80%, you've got something strong to build upon. Now, this is where it's interesting as a challenge for us as teachers. If not everybody is ready, some people, uh, the individuals who are above 80 percent, they need to do enrichment and enhancement work. The problem solving the stuff that you can find from Enrich is a really good website for that kind of thing. Um, but the people who aren't above 80 percent, we've got to correct them until they are above 80 percent. You can't learn how to add fractions 
unless you know how to find equivalent fractions. That's more or less the facts of, facts of it. Unless you try and teach tricks. And if you teach tricks, there aren't any understanding to build upon anybody anyway. Now, I don't fully agree with this whole diagram as a, as a system of teaching, but it's a fascinating book, Teaching for Mastery by Mark McCourt. He used to lead the NCTM. He's now the guy who's written the, edu um, the EIF information for Ofsted for Maths. You, he's completely worth following on, on, on Twitter, at eMaths. Um, but he's, a, he's an incredibly intelligent man. Um, but this is his system of learning. It doesn't work unless you pick it up for all schools. Um, but it's certainly an interesting thing to consider. And I do agree the prerequisites are important before we approach any work. So what's it mean to have mastered something in maths? Well, uh, Helen Joy has written a brilliant book for primary. In fact, you know what? I'm just going to go off onto the camera to show you a couple of books here. If I go to my left, here's the Teaching for Mastery book, just like that. Um, if you've got some time in your hands at the moment uh, for all, in fact, for non-just maths teachers as well. Uh, but it really is a very, very, very good book. Uh, the Teaching for Mastery for you primary specialists. Mastering Mathematics, Teaching to Transform Achievement, Helen Jory, you can see her name hopefully at the bottom if I hold it like that. Uh, a really, really good book for you to consider as a whole school approach, just looking at this page straight away here and talking about some of the levers that would help you, um, Achievement for All Pupils. Really good, strong book. The Secondary Pupils, she's actually done a secondary one as well. Um, again, a really, really sound book with lots of pedagogy ideas, well worth uh, investing in as a department. So on page one of one of those books, what's it mean to have mastered something? Well, what I would say here is using math, the keywords I'm looking for, mathematical language, represent it in multiple ways. We had the bar model earlier on, but maybe you can do the abstract. Maybe you can use algebra tiles. We'll look at those a little bit later on as well. Can think mathematically, independently apply to a totally new problem in an unfamiliar situation. I think the starter question was an example of that. There was fractions. There was a little bit of percentages, wasn't there? Um, there was subtraction. There was um, short division. It was an unfamiliar scenario, but those who are fluent would be able to um, access that with time if they've been given the opportunity to do more problem solving. Teaching for mastery. Well, for those of you who sign into Math No Problem in the primary sector, you'll have seen some of these names because Yip Ban Ha, um, the, uh, let's say the main spokesman for Math No Problem, at, well, a, a day with him completely changed me. Him and Steve Lomax are my, are my maths um, gurus, if you like, maths pedagogy gurus. Steve Lomax is the leader for Glow Maths Hub. He's also the host of Can Do Maths and Kangaroo Maths. Uh, Yip Ban Ha is a safe and maths no problem. And it's this research that we use. Dean's Blocks, you may recognise the second name down there for those of you who use Dean's Blocks in school. Vykotsky, we're talking about the zone of proximal development. Uh, Brunet and, and Skemp both talk about the con concrete pictorial abstract approach, aka using materials, then the pictures, and then, of course, the abstract form that we're used to. But again, something I've, I've, I've tried to reiterate, we want mastery, for in my eyes, it's a deep understanding of the maths they are learning. It's not teaching for tricks. If we make connections between topics, uh, we know more about brain and cognitive load now uh, and, and how everything interconnects and all the nodes interconnect, if we can make those connections with previous learning, then it's more likely to stick. These following slides are from the NCTM, actually, and so I wanted to make that clear before I presented that. Now, <laughs> Mastery says that pupils are either born with the maths gene or not just good at maths. Well, it's not true. I might be good at maths, but it's because I've learned different methods. I'm not the greatest mathematician. I can tell you I didn't complete my maths degree. I started it, and I didn't finish it. I did. I wasn't engaged. Maybe the teaching was bad, probably. Um, but I just didn't finish it. I wasn't interested. Um, but it's not about being just good at maths. I wasn't born and I didn't know my five times table when I was born. And that's not how it is. A mastery approach is a set of principles and beliefs. And we believe that with good teaching, a can do attitude, all children can achieve and enjoy maths. Well, false. There is one set of mathematical concepts and big ideas for all. And that should be true. That should be what we're aiming for as teachers. We can't be saying, oh, no, those kids won't actually be able to achieve that. Let's go back to our five variables on, t on from, uh, from Bloom. It's about the, the, the time that we can give, the different ways we can give it as well. The pupils have got to put that effort in as well. And there is no reason why all pupils can't access that maths. It just might need different methods. It might need more time. All pupils need access to these concepts. Mathematics is 
Quite simply, mathematics, the building blocks are important for everyone. The foundations are important for everyone. I use the example of adding fractions and equivalent, knowing equivalent fraction before you start. Challenge should be provided through acceleration into new content. Well, this is one big fat false, and the national curriculum says something similar as well. Um, the class works together on the same topic. Now, this is something that I'm seeing more and more in mixed ability, mixed attainment classes. Not saying I'm an advocate for those, by the way, certainly not in secondary schools. Um, I think the gap is too wide currently. We don't have a good enough resource base for it. But what I do believe in, 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 in let's face fact, every class is slightly mixed attainment anyway. But challenge is provided through depth rather than acceleration into new content. So let's go in. We'll go back to my adding fractions. And let's say we're adding fractions with the same denominator. Um, what you then do is come up with reasoning and problem solving questions that are about that. Not some pupils, the red table, they can go on to um, work with. In fact, you know what? This might be one of those times where I'm best going onto a camera. And I've got myself a little post it note here. Uh, so the whole class are doing work on, let's say, a third plus two thirds. And let's uh, try and get that to be a little bit more focused. Um, I'll try and work that out. Oh, that was good. Uh, a third plus two thirds and then two thirds plus one third. I think that's an interesting question because we can talk about commutativity. They're the same question. And some people will hopefully reason that and explain that to you. Um, then you might have four fifths plus two fifths. You might have seven ninths plus one ninth, whatever it might be. What I call A01 questions, fluency questions. But then it's not some people's going on to let's go on to. Um, oh, well, uh, two thirds plus four fifths because that red zone, they can handle that. They're doing really well. That isn't right. That isn't fair. The topic today, um, you notice about the mastery, um, the research earlier on, we talked about one uh, breaking the idea into small chunks and that is actually one of the five big ideas from the nctm today's chunk is adding fractions with the same denominator so we'll have the fluency questions some people's may make it on so we'll get rid of that we don't want you the ao2 questions so let's say paul thinks that two uh, two fifths plus one fifth equals three tenths convince me is paul right or wrong I am doing the fast writing because I'm a little bit nervous. Is Paul right or wrong? Now, this is where we get the reasoning from the pupils. They have to use the proper language. They have to explain and think about the questions. This is actually more and more common in GCSE now as well for those of you secondary colleagues. And you should be explaining what the mistake has been made. Then when you start moving on to AO3 questions, you might go onto a website called Open Middle. These are it's a fantastic website for empty box questions. So it might be something like this. And I haven't prepared this, so I've now got to make it up off the top of my head. Give a solution that, that gives an answer of, let's say, four fifths. So they have to create their own question and fill in the blanks there. Now, what will happen if they, those who have got to this stage, they won't put a two and a three there. They will know that the numbers at the bottom, a.k.a. the denominators, they have to be the same. But what we're then doing, the depth is coming through fluency, reasoning and problem solving. That is what the national curriculum states is depth, fluency, reasoning and problem solving. So let's go back to uh, the PowerPoint. There it is. Um, challenges provided through depth rather than acceleration into new content. And so it starts in thinking about those reasoning questions we can ask and those problem solving questions as well. Now, interestingly, again, this is an NCTM slide. Mastery says that you don't move on until every child in the class can get 80% of the test. The NCTM say it's false. Yeah, I go back to the teaching from Mastery book and they say it's true. This is the problem with the word mastery. Now, I do believe we have to have prerequisites tested beforehand. But this is the problem with mathematics, well, no, with, with, with education, as a matter of fact. We're a social science, and a social science doesn't have right and wrong. And I try to avoid using the words right and wrong. I try to think about what's most impactful, what's most effective. Um, more time is spent on teaching topics to allow for the development of depth. That I agree with. Absolutely, I agree with. Um, but it's just interesting, again, because we're a social science, we can't all agree on education. Some of you are going to be saying uh, not liking what I'm talking about this morning. I'm hoping you'll take some positives away. I don't think you're going to agree with everything with me. If you did agree with everything, then I'd ask you to challenge me harder. Um, 
And as such, Paul, uh, producer Paul, there haven't been any uh, abusive messages sent on the chat so far, have there? No, no messages. It's all good. Good, good, good. I, I take that as a positive. Um, but so you can put some thumbs up, people, every now and then if you like, just to make me feel good about it. Uh, Matthew says you should be able to apply knowledge in unfamiliar situations. Well, that in that one is true. We're talking about your AO3, your problem solving. And if you know why, as well as that and knowing how, it means you're able to use it, um, use, use your knowledge flexibly and creatively in those unfamiliar scenarios. What about Ofsted? Well, we're always worried about that. Now, I'm about to give you the second and possibly the, the best tip of the day because you're, you're spending the time. If you're, you're that committed to listening today, so thank you. I'm going to give you a podcast that I really think you should listen to. But the national curriculum, as it says here, if I just get my icon, uh, my cursor, pupils are expected to move through the program of study at broadly the same pace. In all key stages, pupils who grasp concepts rapidly should be challenged through rich, sophisticated problems before acceleration through new content. So today's lesson again was about adding fractions with the same denominator, then everyone in the classroom keeps doing that. You come up with your reasoning problem questions, things like the clumsy Clive, if you've seen those on, on TES. Uh, I don't use TES very often, but someone's shared clumsy Clive questions, which are reasoning questions, which are excellent and they're all free. Uh, acceleration, uh, rich, sophisticated problems. I've mentioned open middle and rich, great resources to making sure you are everyone in the classroom doing the same topic. It's just the fact that some maybe are doing more advanced, more complicated problems. This was a tweet that was a few years ago. Bruno Reddy, the guy behind Times Table Rockstars, he asked Jane Jones, who was leader for maths at the time of Ofsted, but it's still obviously um, her influence is still there. We discussed the national, oh, pardon me, the question from Bruno Reddy. Will inspectors appreciate schoolwork may appear not to be differentiated. I'm not going to lie to you. I do not like rag questioning. If I go and watch it in secondary schools, why should if the, if the teacher has taken the time to really carefully think about the questions, why should there be red, amber, green questions? Um, the Tom Franklin podcast with Mr. Barton is a pupil that he, he's a massive advocate of mixed attainment in all at all key stages. He gave out worksheets. And he gave out green to some and he gave amber to one girl and the amber the girl turned around and said why have you given me the easier sheet sir i thought you believed in me i think that's really powerful i think that's really powerful there's scaffolding maybe that everyone gets the same questions some of us get the different support through scaffolding that's one of the key things for me in mathematics but it's not red amber green questions some pupils doing the green questions some doing the red I, I'm quite passionate about that. You can tell I'm quite passionate anyway. Uh, differentiation likely to be more subtle. If we look at the second response from Jane Jones here, different depth, AO1, AO2, AO3. Some schools are doing the do it, uh, well, do it, twist it, solve it model. Again, that's uh, Steve Lomax, Kangaroo Maths. He's the one who's, who's created that. Again, my maths guru, look him up. Uh, different support and challenge. I've just mentioned that through scaffold, for example, and the questioning, not only that questioning AO123 independently, but cold calling across the classroom as well. So here's tip number two. Jane Jones does a fabulous, fabulous resort, uh, podcast with Craig Barton. Um, it's well worth listening to. It puts you at ease as to the things you should be doing in your school for maths. Um, and that applies to all key stages. Um, so listen to her guidance as to what they're looking for when they're visiting. Uh, but I, I, I like this slide. Differentiation likely to be more subtle. The different depth, the approaches such as the concrete pictorial abstract, different supports such as concrete pictorial abstract and scaffolding, and that questioning you do as well. And uh, it was on her podcast I heard that 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 line that I've, I repeated earlier on. Maths shouldn't be about rules because it's about rules. There are too many to remember. If we've got that interconnection of understanding they're more likely to be able to repeat them. We know more about cognitive load and, and um, how the brain works than ever before. Oh, that was an exciting transition. So we mentioned the curriculum. I went and see increasingly complex problems over time, conceptual understanding. And we learn conceptual understanding through the visualization of maths. AO2, about a third of the GCSE, reasoning mathematically by following a line of inquiry, conjecturing relationships, generalizing. Now, generalizing could be using algebra. Now, why is it in Shanghai they use algebra? They use A to represent a variable and X to represent a variable from age, what, four, five, six? They're not waiting until secondary school. So can we generalize the other wonder? Can we prove using proper mathematical language, just stating right there? 
why should we lower the tone for some pupils then we should all be consistent in our classrooms we're not all it's unlikely that a pupil is taught by the same teacher throughout all the years so it's important we all use the same high standards of mathematical language solve problems uh, routine and non-routine problems and this requires a certain resilience uh, i know schools use things like rucksacks some schools do not like rucksack at all uh, but i think the key word here might be perseverance and how we can teach that to our pupils isn't for today but it's certainly an interesting conversation so there it is all pupils become fluent they all reason mathematically they all solve problems and so that then maybe makes you argue with me well my suggestion earlier on i'm going to go onto my camera again my suggestion earlier on that lessons would have an AO1 questions and then the pupils will do AO2 and then the pupils will do AO3. Well, tell you what, why not start the lesson with an AO3? Get everybody discussing in the classroom what possible methods. So it gives them an idea as to what kind of work they're accessing. And then you go on to the AO1s. Please don't think anything's as rigid as always doing AO1, AO2, AO3. You can change your mind absolutely entirely. Um, it makes sense. But vary the lessons up. If, if lessons are the same every day, you're going to get bored just as much as maybe the kids might do as well. So we need to look at the five big ideas. Um, I'm going to take a quick drink while you have a look at these. And there they are, the five big ideas for teaching for mastery. And we mentioned fluency and representation a little bit already. Uh, just a reminder, by the way, I'm hoping not to go past half 11. I will stop by half 11 no, no matter what. I can go on a bit and I've not done this session online before. So um, <laughs> you know, I, I put it at 60 to 90 minutes. If anyone who knows me, the chance of it being 60 minutes are pretty slim, uh, but I'm trying my best to fit everything in. But I wanted everyone to get that background of, of my passion for pedagogy. Uh, but a lot of it has come from these five big ideas. When I started as a teaching for mastery specialist a couple of years ago with the NCTM in the Central Maths Hub, these are the five big ideas that are presented to secondary and to primary schools. The approach to mathematics should be no different. For those of you within the ATLP, I am almost certain, in fact, I am certain that we have a teaching for mastery specialist at Slade Primary School, um, and they will be using the same five big ideas as well. So my intention is to try and cover each of these this morning and mathematical thinking I'll start with and what's it mean to think mathematically and even just to answer this question makes me think okay how can I approach lessons how can I get kids to approach lessons to think mathematically as opposed to just doing the math I don't want them just to engage with following an algorithm you keep the second the first fraction you flip the second you change I, I don't like that at all these are the key messages for my mathematical thinking it's central to deep and sustainable learning. We need it to make it go deeper so it stays in the long term memory. And when we make those connections later, later on, we bring it back to the short term memory as well. We can use it. Taught idea. This this second point here is really interesting. Taught ideas that are understood deeply are not just received passively, but are worked on by the students. They need to be thought about. They need to be reasoned with and discussed. If lessons are taught for mastery, again, my inverted commas, saying you can't see them every time I do it. We want the pupils talking in maths lessons, talking about what they did and why. Convince me is a lang uh, an expression I use in lessons all the time. When a pupil gives me an answer, convince me you're correct. Convince me another way. I want them to show me that it's correct and understand using the proper, proper language and what they did, why it works. If they just follow the algorithm, AKA the method we taught them with no understanding, then they've received it passively. They haven't given it any thought. Memory is the residue of thought. And that's a, a Daniel Willingham um, expression. And for me, it sticks more. And do you know what? It's so important. Dual coding tells us this, that hearing something is not as powerful as seeing it as well. So memory is the residue of thought. Willingham, I'm going to pretend I know the year by writing 2015, but I don't think I don't know if that's correct or not. I.e. it's going to stick if we've made them think about it, if they've had to reason in the lesson, if they've had to explain to each other, preferably using the proper language. Memory is the residue of thought. It will stick if they've thought about it. If going back to this slide now, if they received it passively, they haven't thought about it. It's less likely to stick. So we talked about the, um, we mentioned it, in fact, just going back a moment, if I may, looking for relationships and connecting ideas. This is a superb slide 
uh, from Can Do Maths. I mentioned Steve Lomax earlier on, the head of the Glow Maths Hub. One fact, I don't like the fact it's in the triangle, by the way, I think that's the wrong representation. But in the top left on the screen uh, of your uh, screen, you can see if I know, and what it's supposed to be indicating is seven times eight is 56. Now, if you know that, you can write this. You can write seven times eight equals 56. You could also fill this in. Eight times seven is 56. Math, uh, multiplication is commutative. That is so important to reiterate over and over again. If I know this one fact, eight times seven is 56, then I also know that 56 divided by seven equals eight. I also know that 56 divided by eight equals seven. I also know, and you notice the difference here, I've taken this first mathematical uh, number sentence and I've rewritten it. 56 equals what? Equals seven times eight. Now this equals sign, it doesn't mean the solution to today's problem. It means what's on the left is equal, is the same to what is on the right. If we misteach the, the, the importance of that equal sign, if we're telling them that means what is the answer to, then that doesn't help us when we're solving equations in key stage three and key stage four. The equal sign in, means is the same as, is equal to, is a, um, whatever I do on one side, therefore I must do to the other, which really helps us with equations. But you notice this one fact here, and I am going back again, seven times eight equals 56. Therefore, I also know that seven is a factor of 56. I also know, therefore, that eight is a factor of 56. Now, we learn about factors and multiples from, is it year three? I know you start doing arrays. So you must start talking about factors at that stage, I would imagine, or certainly could start mentioning the words then. Uh, that, therefore, 56 is a multiple of seven. Therefore, 56 is a multiple of eight. And 56 is a common multiple of seven and eight. Now, this slide is actually a year six slide. I don't deny I use it in secondary schools because it's a brilliant slide to make clear all the interconnections from just one fact in that top left hand slide there. Looking at the third column, a seventh of 56 is eight. It's all come from this one fact. Seven times eight is 56. And because seven times eight is 56, I know that seven times 80 is 560, all coming from one fact. The interconnection of maths is vital to make sure they don't think all the it, fractions of amount, the third column, they don't, do, do we make it explicit that it's just times tables? Factors and multiples, do we explicitly point it out in our classroom that it's related to times tables? And there's been some research on this as well, low attainment in maths. So the Nuffield Foundation, uh, of course, more commonly now uh, referred to the work they do through the EEF. Things which make a big difference to low attainers are number lines, arrays, are ah, so the representation and the derived facts. And this is what I've just been talking about. Students rarely use derived facts. They rarely estimate and teachers do not teach them explicitly. We do not explicitly point out this third column here is all from times tables believe the derived facts are obvious but they're not unless we tell them everything we ever learn no matter what you know, some of you might have maths anxiety might be nervous about teaching maths and that's people like me to try and support you with um but students have that maths anxiety in fact it might be english you'd, you'd be anxious about but you don't know something until you're taught it and so therefore it's us our job as teachers to make it absolutely obvious what those derived facts are Seven times eight equals 56. Therefore, 56 divided by eight equals seven. That is our job to be explicit about those. Um, it, students are unfamiliar with derived facts. We need to make that a bigger part of our lesson. Make connections. When we go back to the five, um, five big ideas, which we'll see a few times in today's presentation, you will see the words making connections over and over again. Because we do make those connections again, we know it's more likely to stick. Memory is the residue of thought. So when asking about mathematical thinking, one of the five big ideas, what questions do mathemat mathematicians ask themselves? We ask, what if I did this? What if I change this? So let's have a go at something like that. Now, these questions here would be some AA1 fluency. Now, they all look a little bit similar, but is that a problem? Is that a problem? You could just see these as a series of questions on how to find fractions of amount. And the pupils could do them without any real thought, just follow the algorithm, follow the method you've been taught today, uh, a third of 12. So you divide by three and then you times by the numerator. You divide by the denominator, you times by the numerator. You divide by the denominator, you times by the numerator. You can't tell me this is nothing but rote learning. 
No understanding. If all you've got to do today, children, is divide by the numerator, time by the denominator. Divide there, there. I'm sorry, after a while, I'm finding it, I'm finding myself painful, as probably were you. So I'll be more positive again. Look at these relationships between these two questions here. Now, if I started to think about the questions and the kids engage with the relationship between the questions, now we're getting them to think mathematically. I had two thirds of 12. Then I wanted two thirds of 24. So I'll tell you what, let's do that on a slide. Let's do that on the camera. I had what, two thirds? Am I using one of my purple pens? No, I'm using a blue one today. That's a shame, my purple pen's great. Right, two thirds of 12. Well, I'm going to break 12. This whole thing here is 12. I couldn't be a primary school teacher. My, my writing's too scruffy. Um, now, what about, though, if it's 24? Well, hold on a second. There's a relationship between these two numbers here. There's a relationship. It's twice as big. So for each of these parts being four, well, that means, oh, the camera's gone fuzzy. Hopefully you'll bear with me. Uh, that means all of the parts must be twice as big as well. And so I don't need to do the algorithm. I don't need to do the divide by the new uh, denominator, time by the numerator. That's not understanding the questions that are going on. That's not thinking about mathem mathematically thinking about the relationship between the questions. And this is where we can get our pupils to really think as opposed to just throwing 10 questions uh, that have no relationship to each other whatsoever. Look at those two there. Now, if we found out six eighths of 24, I know that's three quarters, you'll notice by the question five and question six are the same. Um, they've been reworded slightly differently. And again, if people notice that, that's great. They've reasoned with it. They've engaged properly as opposed to they haven't passively taken on the questions. But look at the relationship between question six and seven there. It's one eighth fewer. And if they've been using the bar model, they'll know that an eighth in that question is three pounds. So take away three pounds you to go from question six to question seven. Take away three pounds. Don't divide by the numerator, tied by the uh, other way around, divide by the denominator, tied by the numerator. That won't be. Well, it's, it's not efficient. And is that the, what's the most flu what's the most efficient way? And that's fluency. What's the most fluent, efficient way of um, answering questions? We'll come to fluency a little bit later on. I don't know why the screen's blue. I didn't expect that. Um, look at the first two qu two questions, if I may. So subtracting fractions, two fifths take away a seventh. If you've worked it out using your algorithm, that's fine. It's nine thirty fifths. But if I made, if I turn those two um, numbers around, if I change the order of them, it doesn't equal nine thirty fifths anymore. So subtraction isn't commutative, like addition that we talked about earlier on. But the difference between them is still the same. I haven't changed the numbers that I've been subtracting from each other. So the distance between them on a number line is still the same distance. It just I happen to now be going in a different direction on the number line, which is why number lines are so important. So that's why the answers have a relationship to each other. But look at the question again. If the pupil did question one and then did question two, they'd be looking at those and saying, hold on, they're the same numbers. And they're properly engaging with the reasoning with the questions. Look at those two there. Now, because of time, I don't think I'm going to go into the detail that I did about it. Um, I wanted to about this. But why is it that the, the numerators are both the same? The difference between the denominators is the same. Interestingly, they both got the same answer. They've, still, they've both got a four on the top. They've both got a four as the numerator. That's interesting. Now, here's what I did earlier. I was doing this last night with my scribble. If a over x take away a over y, well, equals a over y, uh, you, know, you make the uh, denominators the same. And so I can factorize, so I've got a, so, oh, it's interesting. I'm sorry if it's a little bit small, but a brackets y minus x. So what have I noticed here? It's a constant difference, it's the two between them. And that's one of the reasons why we've got the four on top, because two was the uh, numerator and that two as well. Some people might not, yeah, I'm only doing this quickly. Um, I appreciate that everybody's gonna access this part. Some learners need more time and some learners need more um, scaffolding. Um, but I just wanted to share that because it was it was next to me. Look at these questions here, key stage four. Look at the relationship between those two questions. If I was simplifying root 72, well, this is five times bigger. So I just multiply this answer by five. I don't need to do the algorithm of finding the highest square number that goes into the root and then divide it into two square roots. I don't need to do that. 
What's the most efficient method? I've used reasoning because I've been engaging with the questions. Uh, for primary colleagues, this comes from a really good book at the bottom. You can see there, Mike Askew, Transforming Primary Maths. Uh, this, these questions, in fact, I can tell you this book's been cited over and over when it comes to math, math, math teaching in primary schools, so it's certainly worth having on your shelves. Um, compare these sets of calculations. I'm just going to have a drink uh, while Paul has a look to see if, if I've had any abuse on the chat as well. Have you noticed, do you notice anything? What's the same between set A and B? And what's different between set A and B? OK, um, you may or may not have noticed they are the same questions. They're exactly the same questions on the right hand side as they are on the left hand side, but we've changed the order. Now, why is it that's more powerful? Look at question set B. The difference between them, you'll notice, is 30. For this one, it's still 30 because I added two to this number and added two to this number. The minuend and the subtrahend, the words I should be using, which in secondary schools we're not using. Primary schools are using it more than ever before. The secondary schools have not picked that up yet. Um, but because I've added two to each of them, the difference is still the same. Interesting, I've subtracted three from the minuend and the subtrahend. And so therefore, the difference is still the same. Interesting how these questions just reordered can be a very, very different exercise for pupils. By the way, this sentence here, what's the same, what's different, very powerful in a math lesson. Right then, um, this is an activity I've done plenty of times, uh, but I am going to quickly do with you guys. On your whiteboard, if you all had one, what would you draw? If you've got a piece of paper, feel free to do it. I'm not going to ask everyone to show me. It'll be a nightmare. I think we've got 50 or 60 people here today. Um, can you do the following? If I ask you to draw a pentagon and ask you to write down a quadratic equation, just give you a chance to think about that. What would you draw? What would you write? OK. Paul, any abuse or questions, by the way? No abuse or questions. No, no, it's all good. Okay. <laughs> I have written something down. Do you want to see it? Yeah, go on. You can be Mike, because you want to, just to clarify, producer Paul is not a um, math teacher. So can you? Ah, interesting. OK, can I make that bigger at all? Um, that probably help. Yes, you can. So AX squared plus BX plus C. Thank you very much. I'm going to write that down onto my book. And you've done a pentagon for me as well. I'm going to write that onto my book as well. Thank you, Paul. Super stuff. Um, right. Can I remember how to go onto my camera? Can everyone see my camera again now? I'll just, Paul will tell me and say yes. Now, yes. let's go to the pentagon first. Uh, Paul, go on. We'll, we'll carry on with the vault. Why did you draw that? Um, just because I knew it had five sides. Ah. So when we ask our pupils what's a pentagon, we'll say it's got five sides. OK. Is this a pentagon? Paul, I'm going to keep you involved. Is that a pentagon? No. But you said it's got five sides. That's got five sides. They have to join up. Ah, well, you didn't say that. So we, we my language, um, yes, I'm picking on you. And thank you, Paul, for, for being willing to be picked on, by the way. We've got to be particular about that. Now, it's, it's not a shape with five sides because this has got five sides. One, two, three, four, five. Is that a pentagon, Paul? Yes. Ooh. But I don't really know. Conversation. Now it's interesting because that word variation appeared a few moments ago on the screen from Mike Askew and we're on to variation. We're talking about examples and non-examples and these are so key when it's to the learning of mathematics. The kids are usually shown this pentagon, but is that a pentagon as well? The answer is no, because a pentagon is a five-sided polygon. Well, what's a polygon? Let's find out. Uh, let's go back to this slide here. So I looked up the NCTM glossary because this is a, uh, a, a document that's been created to help us all use the same language in classrooms. So the key stages one to three, all the language we meet in those uh, key stages. Um, I looked at oh, the word pentagon. There it is. A polygon with five sides and five interior angles. But I've used the word polygon. So what's a polygon? I looked it up. It's a closed plane figure. Now, the word closed, as what Paul said a moment ago, joined up. Uh, bounded by straight lines, a plain figure, in other words, a 2D figure. So therefore, uh, my second tip, to the top, my third tip, sorry, download this document for your departments. Make sure everybody's speaking the same language by using this as a constant thing to go back to. If you're not sure how to describe something in the lesson, then model it in the classroom. I have this 
cheesy little kind of jingle that I play that I go to Dictionary Corner and it's only words and words are all I have and so on. So we go to the dictionary and we learn what a pentagon is. Um, make, this is a really useful document to ensure that everyone's speaking the same language and the right language as well. Um, so let's go back to my camera. So we said a pentagon is a closed five sided. Um, well, we said it's a five sided, a five sided polygon. So one, two, three, four, five. I can have a conversation with my pupils. Is that a pentagon? And they look at it and, and I still get secondary pupils who'll turn to me and say it's not a pentagon. I'll ask why. And they say it has to be this. And that's because we haven't shown them enough examples of a pentagon. That is a pentagon. One, two, three, four, five. It's not a regular one. We'll talk about that another day. Tom. But it's still a pentagon. I, Paul, hello. Question um, from Claire Harris. Hello, Claire. Um, it says, do you ever use POG sheets, which is peculiar, obvious, generalised? Um, it's good for exploring topics such as properties of shapes. Do you know what? I took that uh, slide out of the presentation last night. How dare you make me think I should have left it in? Um, it, it's really the, the general. Um, I might be able to find it. I'll see if the slide's there. Uh, but it's a really nice activity. That's from the ATM book called Thinkers. That exact um, uh, activity is from the ATM Association of Teaching and Maths. Um, I think, yes, so POG, I haven't called it, heard it called POG before, that sounds really fun, that's much nicer than what I call it, um, but trying to get them. They also, think about Freya models here, so your examples and non-examples, and I haven't put Freya models in this today because I was going to do a greater depth session later on in a few weeks, um, and I've mentioned them there, so I'll, I'll mention them now, but I'll, I'll go into them more detail. Um, but you're absolutely right, it was clear, wasn't it? Um, showing more and more examples of it, so a peculiar print again is this one. Oops, look on our screen. One, two, three, four, five, brilliant, five straight sides. That's still a pentagon. Now imagine the activity in the classroom if you get the kids to show me one, show me another, show me another one that no one else will show me. And there's a bit of challenge in the room and you've got those kids really willing to push it and try and draw the silly ones like this, but it's still a pentagon. Five straight sides. Pog's a really good idea, but I thanks for that contribution, really useful. Um, Paul, you did this as your quadratic equation. And if we give all our questions in this form, they'll think that's the only form a quadratic equation could be in. But what about this? The question is, is that still a quadratic equation? And the answer is yes, because we have a the highest exponent, the highest power of X is two, and there are no uh, negative powers. Um, and so it's an equation because we've got the equal sign, uh, but the highest power, the highest exponent of X is two or the variable. And so it is a quadratic equation. But the problem is, if kids see every question that looks like this, and then they see another question that looks like this, and they see another question that looks like this, they're going to think all quadratic equations have to be in that order, and they're going to think that it always equals zero. We should be varying the uh, questions, and that applies to second, uh, secondary and primary as well, thinking about the, the order in which we represent the questions. So uh, POG was a really good example to remind ourselves not to use the regulars all the time. If we say this thing here is a pentagon, then we need to show them what else is a pentagon. Show me one, show me another. It's a really good way, a uh, really good example. So there's my probing question. Show me one, show me another, show me one that no one else will show me. The use of whiteboards is fantastic for that exercise in the classroom. So um, much of when we talk about variation, uh, this paper here from 2004, um, the central idea of teaching with variation, highlight the essential features. The essential features are a pentagon, five straight sides, it's closed. I could vary the non-essential. The lengths can vary. The angles within, the interior angles, they can vary also. But you ca can't change the fact that a pentagon has to have five straight sides and you can't change the fact it's got to be closed. They are essential but you vary the non-essential. Learning only happens if we some variation to discern. And he sees learning as discernment of variation. Yes, I'm using big words that I have to look up every time I use this one. But in other words, from, for me, very, in fact, I know uh, the English skit leader, leader uh, is, is listening. So if I don't use the right description of this word discernment, I will probably get criticised. Um, but for variation to serve, for variation to understand, variation to 
consider and to explain perhaps what can you vary, what can't you vary. There it is. The aims of the national curriculum. It's no different key stage one to four. Conceptual understanding. We need to be able to say what the concept is and what it isn't. That's the conceptual variation chart that we often use. Uh, some people will argue that there's no such thing as conceptual and procedural variation. But do you know what? If we're all thinking about the standard and the non-standard variation and the negative variation, not something I've mentioned yet so much. So let's do some standard form. <laughs> if I could see everybody, I'd do thumbs up and thumbs down. Is that standard form? Well, the rules are in the top right hand corner. Like the Shanghai lessons, they always have that. That, that will be on the board for the whole lesson. These facts in the top right hand corner. Oops, I'm just going to, my apologies, let's do that again. Brilliant. This fact in the top right hand corner is always there for the pupils to refer back to. Now, is it true the first number is between 1 and 10? Yes. Is it a power of 10? Yes. Is the power an integer? Yes. So therefore, it's standard form. Oh, by the way, multiplication in the middle as well. Is that standard form? Does it meet all the criteria? Yes. Is that standard form? No, the non-examples, and you can just show example after example to people to discuss. Yes, no, example, non-example. The non-examples are incredibly powerful. In fact, they have, they, have, they have just as much use in every classroom, in every key stage. Showing them the example and non-example is really important. <gasps> oh my, it's a decimal. The first number's a decimal. No, sir, that's not true anymore. But of course it still is, because it's still a number between one and 10. It didn't have to be a whole number. So I varied it ever so slightly to get the pupils to think. <gasps> it's a negative, it's a negative power, sir. Oh, it can't be true anymore, sir. It's still true. The power is still an integer. So the conversation I'm having with the pupils, and I've got my current job by doing this exact lesson. So it must have been okay. Um, okay, maybe. Um, but I went through them. Is it or isn't it? Non-example, example. Tell me why. And they have to say to me, if you can't just say it's a negative, well, tell me about it. Why? Which one's a negative? The power is a negative. And it's not a minus number, by the way. It's a negative number. Minus is the act of taking away. And one day I'm going to fight this, by the way. And I want the ATLP behind me. And I want the, I'm going to just go on my soapbox for just a second. I want the ATL, ATLP behind me. I want to do a national campaign. And I know Steve Lomax will join me. When it gets cold overnight, it goes to negative three. It doesn't go to minus three. There's nothing subtracting any numbers. It's negative three. Right, off my soapbox and carry on. Oh, look at the size of that power. Sir, that can't be standard form. That number's far too big. But it's an integer. So it's still an example of standard form. It's an odd example, but it's still an example. That one's not true. Ooh, ooh, isn't that interesting? It's still true, it's just an odd non-example. Ooh, pi. Well, its, it's uh, value is approximately 3.14, so yeah, that must be true. <gasps> That's interesting. I just swapped those two numbers around, but it's n the power is not an integer. And I've converted it to 3.4, it's still not an integer. The power of an example, a non-example, really, really important. So what's the concept of standard form here? What are the essential features? They're there on the top right of the screen. What are the non-essential features? Well, it can be any number between one and ten, even pi, even e. What is the non-concept? And we did a few non-concepts in there as well. Some quick, um, I'll bounce these very quickly. Vertically opposite angles, are they? Yes, they are, because the two lines are straight and they're intersecting. Are these two in vertical opposite? No, they're not. Are these two? No, they're not, because the lines aren't intersecting. Are these two? No, they're not. Those lines aren't intersecting to create those angles. Are these two vertical opposite? No, they're not. So the example, non-example. If you're trying to teach a new concept to pupils, don't rush and think explaining one example is enough. In fact, you're doing more damage there. Go through the examples and the non-examples with the essential features and the non-essential features. Again, from the um, Goo paper in 2004, Angle at circumference, a few non-examples there. The concept figure, as they put it, for adjacent angles. Uh, interesting, the word adjacent, I often talk about this. For those of you who remember trigonometry and Sokotoa, um, I didn't know what adjacent meant until I was in my 30s. Because for me, I'd been taught that adjacent was the other angle. I knew the opposite and I knew where the hypotenuse was, but I didn't I saw part with the adjacent side. I didn't know that adjacent meant next to. Um, that shows to me that I wasn't taught it properly. 
So we talked about variation, highlighting the essential features of the concept, what mathematical structures are being highlighted and which are non-essential. Uh, variation and variety are very different. Variation, you put attention to what needs to be changed, what the ball can be changed, pardon me, and what we can't change, what we can't vary. And that slide there is incredibly important. Some examples for Pythagoras, if you give all the questions that look like this, well, they're going to think all right angles look like that. So you can't have the language. So let's go back a bit, actually. Oh, the left number squared uh, add the bottom number squared equals the other one squared. Oh, the, the right number squared now, sir. I don't know. I thought you said it was the left one, sir. Hold on, hold on. The bottom one a minute ago, I had the bottom one. I haven't got the bottom one anymore. Well, this is why we uh, vary the questions, how they how they are presented to the children, but also the language we use is very important. In the first, in all three of those questions, it's the hypotenuse that is missing. The shorter sides we've got. The which one's the hypotenuse? The longest one. Where is the longest side? It's always opposite the right angle. Fantastic. That is more about understanding. Nothing about left and right and following a pattern. Few more examples there which i'm going to um quickly go through i'm going to leave that on screen just to make you realize that they're the same learning point but they've been presented in different ways you'll note on the left hand side for all the questions um the larger variable the larger number of x is always on the left of the equation why there's no reason why it's just late we haven't thought about the thinking oh and it's always x plus a constant Const what about over here? Constant plus a variable. Change the order. Addition is commutative after all. My big ideas. I think we've done a little bit on variation. We've certainly done a bit on mathematical thinking. We have mentioned representation and structure. So let's go on to coherence. Uh, small steps are easier to take. And focusing on one, I have mentioned this actually, haven't I? Focusing on one key point each lesson allows for deep and sustainable learning. And concepts are important precursors to later ideas. Now, this is interesting. Did I not say earlier on that maths is an interconnected series of ideas? Those prere prerequisites are so important to your later learning. And we use it for the deep sustainable learning. We use some of those precursors, those prerequisites later on in our journey. And when something has been deeply understood and maths, as it said on the bottom of the screen here, it can and should be used in the next steps of learning. So we use one key point per lesson. We're not trying to fit too much in. It gives us our opportunity to go in depth. The AO1 to AO3 that we talked about earlier on. The do it, twist it, solve it approach, perhaps, in lessons. So when you're teaching something, what do you need to teach? This is a really nice way of working together as a, as a department. To plan a series of lessons. The key learning point. It doesn't say lesson. It says key learning point. Um, in other words, what's the first thing we need them to learn? Well, for example, going back to that Pythagoras um, example, they need to know what a right angle triangle is. So key learning point one, it might not need a whole lesson, but we need to be sure they know the standard right angle, a non-standard right angle um, triangle. So turning it around, rotating it slightly. What's the difficulty point going to be in that in, in that example? Maybe if you haven't labeled the right angle, are they assuming it's a right angle? Can they prove it's a right angle? So really can just deep understandable uh, with problem solving and reasoning on that point and that point alone on Pythagoras, making sure you know the right angle. Then we need to know, are they good at their square numbers? So this is an example, obviously, for key stage three, key stage four. Um, but you're thinking about the whole key learning journey. We call this the S plan. You'll notice it's not an S, it's a backwards S, so it's kind of a silly name. Um, but it's breaking down. I need to do one key learning point go through all the variation of it, the example, non-example, the challenging part. Now it's time for the next part as well. Ugh, yuck! Not because I don't like KFC the flavour, I don't like KFC the topic. Dividing fractions is an algorithm. There is no understanding involved. Now there's lots of interesting thoughts on this, how you could break it up from a paper in 2008. For lessons on fraction division, you could teach fraction divided by a whole number. So let's say two thirds divided by two. That's really interesting. Two thirds divided by two is really interesting. I'm going to go onto a, a camera because I'm excited now. Two thirds divided by two. Well, hold on a second. The method isn't, I'm sorry if that's blurred. I'm going to try and help you out a little bit. Now, what does that sentence say? That says, I want to divide two thirds into two equal parts. 
Now, sometimes you might want to say how many twos go into two thirds. That maybe doesn't work here. But using different sentences of division really does help. So if I look at two thirds, I want to divide them into two equal parts. Well, there's one equal part and there's the other equal part. So the answer is a third. I'm not using KFC. I'm not going to do two thirds divided by uh, two over one. Keep that one. Flip that one. Change to a multiplication to equal two over six. That's not necessary. It's not fluent. And we're asking them to learn an algorithm as opposed to any kind of understanding of what this fraction means. And I don't mind telling you, I taught a year nine class and I gave them this as a starter. Two thirds. I didn't even say that. I just wrote that on the board. I said, explain that in as many different ways as possible. In a year nine class of 15 pupils, set three or five, I think it was, not one child was able to tell me that it meant two divided by three. And that's because we haven't talked necessarily often enough about what this symbolizes. Two thirds, two of three equal parts. There are three equal parts and I've got two of them. Two divided into three equal parts. Um, yeah, there's just a couple of examples, I suppose. Um, but it's so important to use as many different representations and different language to, to, to suggest what we're trying to, uh, to share. Then you've got a whole number divided by a fraction. So uh, let's do an example of that. So let's do four divided by two thirds. Just wait for it to um, to focus. Hopefully that'll happen in a second. There we go. So if I've got four, do you know what? Just to make life easy, I'm going to do it into divide by a half if you don't mind. And if you don't mind, well, I'm, if you do mind, well, I'm afraid it's too late. Right, there you go. One, two, three, four. This is an interesting one. How many halves go into four? How many halves are there? So I don't just say four divided by a half using different language. How many halves go into four? Well, there are two halves in here. There are two halves in here. There are two halves in this third unit here. And there are two halves in this fourth one here. So how many halves are there? There are eight halves. Now, again, because I said a different sentence, that's very interesting. How many halves go into four as opposed to four divided by a half? And the power of using that different language, using the right sentence for the right scenario can be really interesting. Then you've got a fraction by a fraction. Oh, hello there. We've got a question from Chris. Uh, can the numerator or denominator be also called the divisor or dividend? Would that confuse things? Uh, well, it can be, can't it? So, uh, OK, let's go to the camera. Um, so, um, blah, 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 three over four. You could talk about that and say, well, what do we call this in this instance? What do we call this in this instance? And so actually, I would be saying, yes, um, I would put them next to each other and, and label it like that, saying that's the numerator, that's the denominator. Um, I've got to make sure I remember which one's the right way around because of quotients and divide, dividend. I'm, I'm, I'm open about this. I have not mastered, horrible word, I have not been thorough enough myself yet in making sure I know which one's a dividend, which one's a divisor. But interestingly, when it comes to key stage five, when we teach the quotient rule, well, the word quotient suddenly appears in, 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 in um, key stage five maths, but we haven't used it since key stage one or two. It's not right. Um, I think this is the quotient, isn't it? Um, isn't it? I don't know. So, blah, blah, blah. See, you know, everyone's allowed to get things wrong. Um, but I, I would say absolutely. I wouldn't call that numerator. Into, I would call it numerator and denominator in this instance. I would say divisor, dividend, uh, and uh, quotient, etc. I'd use those words in this instance. I would have them compared to each other and make that really clear and say, yeah, they're interconnected. We're making those connections to make sure there's proper understanding. Chris yeah, okay. um, says that the quotient is the answer. Do you know what? That does make sense. Yeah, that's what I, what I thought, but I was worried I'd get it wrong. So therefore, I think this is the dividend and I think this is the divisor. So I wait to see if anybody tells me. <laughs> I think you divide by the divisor. I'm pretty sure that's right. I hope. I'm going to wait. Could someone do a yes or a thumbs up? I'm going to wait for this one. <laughs> I'll have a drink while thinking about it. I think it's dividend divided by divisor equals quotient. 
Um, Claire agrees with Chris that the quotient is the answer, uh, I think, and that the, you've got it around the right way. Yay! There you go. We've all learned something today. Um, there are other ways of doing this cross multiple. This, uh, people do keep it change for division. Nix the tricks. This is an American document. Well worth looking at. It's about um, uh, 12 rules that when we teach them in primary, they aren't true in secondary. In other words, they're tricks. Nix the tricks. Look at these four steps here. Two thirds divided by two thirds. Well, equals one because they're the same number. Five divided by five is one. Ten divided by ten is one. Two thirds divided by one third. Now that's interesting. It makes sense, doesn't it? How many thirds go into two thirds? Well, there's two of them. For this one, now interesting, not as obvious. Four fifths divided by three fifths. Do you notice? Four divided by three. Four divided by three. I'm hoping you can see the uh, my um, my cursors clearly. I'm going to do that again. This is the hardest part of this bit. Four fifths divided by three three fifths. Well, that's like saying four chairs divided by three chairs is one and a third chairs. I don't know how you get a third of a chair. That's a terrible example, Tom. Four four fifths of an apple divided by three fifths of an apple. Well, you would get four thirds of an apple. Um, how many three fifths go into four fifths is probably the best sentence actually there. I think I confused myself a little bit. Um, but again, think about the, the order I've said it. Well, it's four divided by three, isn't it? Four divided by three, four divided by three. Now, that's interesting. We then can use a different method of it. So if I know how some people keep flip change. Well, why is it for addition and subtraction of uh, um, fractions, we get the same denominator? Look at this top left area here. Well, how about making this question here into the same denominator? Why is it we use a different method for division? Why can't we make those links with equivalent fractions? KFC has no use anywhere else. No use anywhere else in mathematics, none. But this equivalent fractions is used in addition to subtraction of mathematics. And we use it in a lot of equivalent fractions in lots of different ways. Why don't we teach it that way as well, I wonder? Something to consider. I'm going to skip through this because uh, it's uh, I've got 10 minutes and I promise I'm finishing by the end. Um, do I want to do this? Do you know what? Yes, I will. Because I think it's a really nice strategy you can use in classroom very quickly. Uh, Ofsted did some research in teaching problem solving. And when problems are set, teachers don't use them well enough to discuss alternative approaches. Why is one more elegant than another? Um, this is where I'll go onto my camera again. I saw this as a key stage two question in recent years. I think that's fascinating um, because if they've only learnt an algorithm, they'll go one into three, one into two. It's not efficient. They don't understand what's going on. They don't act, if they've done that method and actually use the algorithm. They don't understand what this sentence is asking us. They're saying how many ones go into 327. If, you, if you've understood it as a concept, conceptual understanding, A01 fluency, you don't go, you don't go and do the bus stop. There's my the bus stop. Um, or tell you what, as I'm going to be running out of time soon, I'm going to do my bus stop rant now. I was going to ask one of the questions coming up was factors of 20. OK, now, irritatingly, I've just broken the one I made earlier. Here are my factors of 20 because I've got 20. Uh, unit tiles here and can I yes you can see that's fantastic now I'm using algebra tiles I love algebra tiles they have absolutely a huge place in key stage three and four and I don't see why they don't have a place in key stage two and one either but let's just have a quick look you make a raise in year three as I understand I made it a bit of an array there I think so a fact, so I'd be able to make a rectangle here of area 20 and its dimensions. I'm going to write on my table. It's my table. I can do what I want. Uh, four by five. OK, thankfully. And as much as this is you know, quite extensive at the moment, I've got some of that for afterwards. So that's fine. Uh, four by five. Now, I'm going to move that out of the way a second. I'm going to carry this writing on the on the on the book on the uh, table thing. What about that link there? Suddenly. It's a short division or bus stop. Please get rid of bus stop. It's a short division question. How many fours go into 20? Well, if you made it explicit, linking um, short division to the area of a rectangle, four times what is 20? And we're making those relationships between area of a rectangle 
uh, making a relationship with factors, making the relationships with short division. Division scares pupils. Yet all it is is times tables. All it is is area of a rectangle. Now, of course, by the way, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, just get these back on screen. Unknown participant is now what? exiting. Oh, one, one's leaving. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if you hear that. But I'm sorry to hear the person's gone. Um, I am, I'm, uh, I'm going to assume it was because we're getting late, not because I'm boring anybody. I'm hoping not anyway. Um, I'm able to make another array. Brilliant. And this array is one by, tw uh, one by ten, no, two by ten, pardon me. So let's do that here. So factors of 20, I was able to make four by five. Factors of 20, I was able to make two by, two by ten, pardon me. I'm able to make one by 20. Are there any other rectangles I can make using those 20 tiles? There aren't any more. So those are all the factors. But what about factors of seven? How many, um, how many tiles, can, well, how many rectangles can I make with my seven tiles? And the answer is I can only make one rectangle. And therefore, we are by definition saying a prime number. And this is where I ask everybody to use the same language for this. For a prime number only has two distinct factors. That is the definition of a prime number. Only has two distinct factors. Not is divis uh, you can divide by, um, you can only divide by one in itself. Uh, the word, if you said divisible, that would be correct. But actually, if we're using consistently, only has two factors for prime numbers, then we can relate it back to this area of a rectangle. We can relate it back to um, short division. We can, we can make these relationships and this interconnection of maths that I have talked about, hopefully quite passionately about today. So I'm going to bounce through a lot of this, uh, which is a shame, but um, representation and structure, you've just seen um, one of the five big ideas, which ones haven't we done yet? We, fluency we've kind of referred to, but I'll refer to it in just a moment again. Representation and structure, you've just seen it again when it came to uh, using algebra tiles. Um, representation can pull out the concept. The pattern and structure are related, but pupil, students can see the pattern of the numbers without understanding the structure. They see the structure by seeing the pictures we're drawing. Of course, by the end, we do want the pupils to do the maths without the representation. But from the very beginning to there, I said I want them to understand it. And that's surely how we're going to get them to remember what's been going on. Another tip of today, if you haven't got this document already in your schools, please get it. Um, there are eight suggestions as to how to put, improve maths in all your schools. Uh, there's a RAG document now and you can just read through it and decide red, amber, green, how your school or even just as an individual, do it as an individual if you like. Um, talk through, in fact, you know, I think on the next slide, SCR. Um, do you use manipulatives and representations? Do you teach strategies for solving problems? Do you develop pupils' independence? There are, there are methods explain how to do that in this booklet, but also you can rag rate yourself in your department, which can really help you to find areas to focus on. Um, key states, um, it's from the Education Endowment Foundation, if I haven't made that clear, sorry. It's a free, free document. There is also one for early years and key stage one for those practitioners who are listening, um, focusing in that area. They've just created one of that as well in the last month, month or two, so well worth looking at that. Uh, there's an example of, another example of representation and structure, but um, you'll recognize bar model, many of you, part, part, whole. But what does this sentence say? It says seven plus two is nine. It says two plus seven is nine. It says nine take away seven is two. Well, all of those sentences are the same. A plus B equals C. C take away B equals A. C take away A equals B. B plus A equals C. Really important for manipulation of algebra as well. And I mentioned those derived facts earlier on. We don't teach them explicitly, but they're all related, aren't they? If we know 7 plus 2 is 9, we also know 9 take away 7 equals 2. Um, we're not going to do many more bar modeling and uh, I'm not going to do algebra tiles. Uh, fluency, what I will go to is when we talk about fluency in the five big ideas, it's a mixture of efficiency, accuracy and flexibility. Using an appropriate strategy. Remember that example I used for the bus stop? How many ones go into 327? Do we really want to use the bus stop? <sighs> Short division, please. Accuracy, finding correct solutions. Well, of course, we want them to be accurate, but being flexible and adapting the strategy and transferring across context. So with that one, I'm going to go to talking about the best strategy. Look at this example here. <laughs> uh, primary colleagues, you're going to argue that the, uh, the, the one on the left is best because for some reason it is nationally decreed that you must use that method. 
But look at the, the method on the right hand side, which we can then use when we start multiplying for algebra um, and all sorts in key stage three or four. Now, I'm not saying to you key stage twoers, you need to change. Please don't. You've got to do what you've got to do to make sure you're getting the marks. Um, but what's the same between these two questions? What's the difference? The kids can compare the two and say, well, I can see the 200. Where's the 200 in this question? Well, it's, it's there, isn't it? The two is in the hundreds column. Um, have I put a second example? No, I haven't. That's a shame. Comparing work, uh, fluency, select appropriate strategies and comparing strategies using worked examples. So putting them both on the board and asking pupils to compare those two strategies. What's the same? What's different? They've both got it right. But you can learn about other strategies as well. And I mentioned I, there was an Ofsted slide I put on earlier on. We don't do enough of that in our classroom, getting pupils to compare methods and discuss what's the same, what's different. That book it's referring to, Emma McRae, I am going to go onto my camera to show you this book. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think it's about £10. Um, I can tell you that anyone that I'm training maths with in the future, this is going to be their textbook. Um, it is really, really sound. It's written by somebody who teaches teachers in, in Brighton, Emma McRae, um, but she's written it in a... Can I say non-patronising way in language that I understand? I don't use big words myself. Um, when I use, read some educational books, I really struggle because they're using big words. Um, and I don't necessarily get those. I think this book is it, it, it's superb and I, I think it would apply to all key stages. So those are the five big ideas um, that has changed my teaching. I didn't know what these were um, under two years ago, actually. And I've changed my knowledge because of it. I'd be able to engage with other people because um, with, with like minds, if you like, um, and stretching my maths teaching. So what I'm encouraging you to do is to get involved with the NCTM, get involved with your local maths. So I, I put it on um, slide earlier on for you to please get the uh, newsletter. And obviously things are a bit different at the moment. There aren't any work groups running right now, but get the work group letter. Um, uh, the, the newsletters from each maths hub and see what's going on. If you're a secondary colleague listening at the moment and you want to be one of the teaching for mastery development schools, you then get people like me come and support you. So I then go into schools, I get paid to come in uh, and you get free CBD. In fact, you get paid for this. Um, we will be working with eight secondary schools. We are this term. I think we'll be looking for 16 next term. Uh, two teachers from each school become mastery advocates. So I will work with two advocates in that school. I'd be one of those mastery specialists there to understand the principles and practices. And we'll go through that in a lot more depth, of course, over the course of a year. What you then do as a mastery advocate, you work in your own classrooms and will hopefully work with your own department as well to embed the principles and practices with the support of the specialist and its support throughout the year. So it would be uh, currently we do it as six half day meetings with um, with activities in between. Of course, you can always stay in touch with it as well. Uh, they engage in certain tasks to support the ongoing professional development. We ask leadership to get involved purely so there is a proper embedding of this. What we don't want is two people to learn these strategies and then not share it with everybody else. So it's really important that it becomes a school wide um, initiative. And this is the good news. Uh, there is funding for each participating fun uh, development school. So if you as a secondary school, if you're listening and you apply for this, and you're selected as one of the schools and the applications are now open, um, you will get paid £2,000 to have your school included. You will get this CPD for free. You can use that £2,000 for whatever you like, as long as it's towards this course. I.e. go and buy the manipulatives, go and buy the algebra tiles, go and buy more whiteboards because you think you need them. Go and buy some of the books that I've shown you this morning. Um, hopefully they will be the things you spend the money on. Application forms are now available. Primary colleagues, the menu of events offered will be released after Easter, so sign up to the mailing list because I believe it hasn't been uh, announced yet about how you can be one of the schools. But there is a similar programme in place. Uh, these are always in high demand. Now, with the NCTM and the Maths Hub, the engagement in primary schools is phenomenal. Really strong. It's brilliant. And the language that primary colleagues are using uh, in maths now is, is better and stronger than I'd say than in secondary schools. Um, I am being somewhat critical of secondary schools here because they're less likely, they're less, they're less willing to be engaged with the CPD that's going on. Um, but it's, it's, it's a bit harder to get on those calls because primary colleagues are realising this support is fantastic. And secondary colleagues listening, I urge you stronger than anything I could have possibly urged you. I have changed my pedagogy and I developed my knowledge so much by getting involved with the NCTO. I'm so proud to be part of the Arthur Terry partnership now and to share my knowledge with teachers. 
Um, but that knowledge has come from my work from the NCCM, which is why I like to stay involved with it as well. Hopefully that has been useful for you. I can stick stick around for any questions that come up and they'll do on the chat screen. Uh, but it's for me, as it's got to half 11, to say, so. Oh, hold on, no, no, that's not right. That's better. Uh, so long, farewell. Thank you for giving up an hour and a half of your time. Um, my Twitter handle's on the bottom right. Feel free to message me. You've got my email address. Um, and I'll stick around if there are any questions. And we'll now have lots of people exiting the, the, the room. But thank you for your time this morning. Nice one. Right. I'm hoping this will come off. <laughs> uh, hmm. I got excited and started screaming on that. <laughs>